the Lord with cheerful voice. Himself with mirth, his praise forth hail. Come ye before him and rejoice. Welcome to Woodlawn live stream worship on Sunday morning, May 24th, 2020. This is the live stream pre-recorded service that we have become accustomed to in the last couple of months. 
If you want to see the drive-in service, head on over to Facebook Live to the Woodlawn Baptist Church Conover page. Hopefully you can see what's going on in the student parking lot this morning in worship. Either way, we are excited to have you join us for worship today. Please let us know that you're here by texting the word worship to 828-374-1660 so that we know of your presence in worship. That's our best way of knowing that someone is watching and participating in today's service. If you have not begun either of our devotional sets, uh, they are both still online and available for you. We are involved in a 10-year mission to become a church that makes disciples one by one and one on one, investing our lives personally into the lives of new believers and young believers in the faith to walk with them on the journey to become Christ followers who take on the image of Christ. We have two 30-day devotion sets that are available to you. The first is the Who's Your One devotional set. If you will text the word ONE, that's O-N-E, ONE to 828-374-1660, you will receive a daily prayer guide for 30 days to pray for the one that God has placed on your heart that you need to share in a gospel conversation with and that you need to pray with that they will believe in Jesus Christ as their personal Savior and Lord. Then you will have the blessing of seeing them baptized and leading them on the journey of becoming a growing child in faith. The other devotion set is entitled To Know Him and to Make Him Known and is a 30-day devotional set written by our church pastors and staff along with a few other leaders to encourage you in your journey as you are praying and talking with your one. Text the word KNOW HIM, that's one word, KNOW HIM to the number on your screen 828-374-1660 and you will begin receiving those devotions daily in your messages. During the month of April, since we could not do the regular food roundup for Baptist Children's Homes of North Carolina, we participated in an emergency food drive to collect funds to provide the food and support that they need during this time of quarantine in our nation and across our world. As a church family, we were able to raise almost $4,000 to send to Baptist Children's Homes, and they wanted to say thank you. Watch this. danced over me when I was unaware you sing all around but I never hear the sound Lord I'm amazed by you Lord, I'm amazed by you. Lord, I'm amazed by you. How you love me. Lord, I'm amazed by you. Lord, I'm amazed. Lord, I'm amazed by you, how you love me. So, and see in me a child you call your own. All I'd ever need is waiting here for me, hidden in the heart of you alone. Jesus, you are all the desire of my heart. Oh, I never knew this longing in 
my heart could be filled. Oh, Jesus, you are all the desire of my heart. And I wondered what the purpose of my life was until. I saw your face and softly spoke your name, Jesus. How could he know could he I would walk this road and call me to this moment here and now? Whatever I must do, his promises are true. There's one who hold me up some way, somehow. You are all the desire of my heart. Oh, I never knew this longing in my heart could be filled. Oh, Jesus, you are all the desire of my heart. And I wondered what purpose of my life was until Today I saw your face and softly spoke your name Jesus Jesus longing in my heart could be filled. Oh, Jesus, you are all the desire of my heart. And I wondered what the purpose of my life was until. Today I saw your face and softly spoke your name. Now would you stand and let's sing together. This is my father's world and to my listening ears all nature sings and round me rings the music of the spheres this is my father's world i rest me in the thought of rocks and trees of skies and seas his hands are wonders wrought this is my father's world the birds their carols raise the morning light the lily white declare their maker's praise this is my father's world he shines
This is my Father's world. Oh, let me ne'er forget that though the wrong seems all so strong, God is the Thank you. You may be seated. Would you stand again, please? Let's sing together. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart. 
Lord, I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. I want to see. Thank you. Please be seated. Before we get into today's sermon, 
we had a little surprise for Dr. Yunt this week during the recording session. Take a look at the congregation that was gathered in Kid Zone for today's sermon. Dr. Yunt will mention it as he begins his sermon, and I didn't want you to miss out on the fun. Good Sunday morning to you. We're glad that you're here. It's so good to see you today. And I say that because I'm looking at some of you, Pastor Jerry and um, Miss Erica, put together chairs here in the kids' zone this morning, and they have uh, pictures of some of our members on each seat. So as I look out across the kids' zone, I see some of you in your seat. And it's good to have you here today. I want to invite you to turn with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 20 in the Old Testament. This is a special message. The title of this message is Trusting God Through the Coronavirus. Trusting God Through the Coronavirus. We're going to be looking at different passages of uh, this scripture, different verses in chapter 20 this morning and this will guide us as to the steps that we have to take as believers to trust God to help us through the coronavirus. First, as we start today, let's pray together. Our Father, again, we call on you in prayer. We ask your blessings upon those who have joined us, both members and guests. We ask you again, O oh Lord, that you would speak to our hearts, bring us encouragement, we ask, Father, that you be glorified here today. May anyone who is listening who does not know Jesus receive Jesus to be their Savior today. We thank you for hearing us, and we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. This week, I did a little bit of research on calculated risk. Now, let me say up front so that no one will misunderstand a Christian should not have anything to do with gambling for a lot of different reasons. First, gambling is a sin. And second, it sets a bad example. Third, it's just not very smart because the odds are that uh, you're not going to win, but you're going to lose. But listen to this information that I found on the internet on uh, how you will die. This is a morbid subject, but Listen to what this says. The possibility that you will die in a car crash is one in a hundred in America. The odds that you will die in a murder is one out of 300 in America. The odds that you will die in a fire is one out of 800. The odds that you will die by electrocution is one out of 5,000. The odds that you will die in a flood is one out of 30,000, and the odds that you will die in a tornado is one in 60,000. The odds that you will die by a venomous snake bite or insect bite is one in 100,000, and the odds that you will be struck by lightning happen to be one in 2.8 million. On the other hand, the odds that you will die by food poisoning are one out of three million, the odds that you will die in church are so low that it was not even reported. So a church is one of the best places that we all can be. There are times in life when it seems the odds are stacked against us. I heard a little story about a guy named Brian from Provo, Utah. He was in his apartment 
and it flooded because the guy that lived above him left his bathroom tub water on and the tub ran over and came through the ceiling and flooded Brian's apartment. So the manager told him to go and rent a wet vac and try to clean it up. That's when he went out to go get the wet vac that he discovered he had a flat tire. He changed the tire, went back inside his apartment to phone a friend, but he was standing in water and when he grabbed the phone, the electrical shock he got startled him enough that he accidentally ripped the phone out of the wall. By the time he was ready to leave, the door jam had swelled shut and he couldn't get the door open, so he had to call and get some help. While he was gone, somebody stole his car. He found his car a few blocks away, but it was out of gas and he had to push it to a gas station to fill it up. That evening, Brian attended a military ceremony at his university and he injured himself severely when he sat down on his bayonet that he thought was in the passenger seat, and for some reason it happened to be in the driver's seat. Doctors were able to stitch up his wound, but no one was able to resuscitate Brian's four canaries that were crushed by fallen plaster from the wet apartment ceiling. Maybe you've had a day like that. Maybe you can relate to how Brian felt that day when it seemed like everything was against him. What are we to do when we face insurmountable, overwhelming problems? What are we to do as Christians when we face a pandemic like the coronavirus? There are a lot of hurting people today. <clears throat> They're having a hard time. They don't know which way to turn. And we are looking today at how we trust God when life is hard, how we trust God when we go through something like this coronavirus, and we find the answers in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Now, let me give you the background. There are three enemy nations of Israel that have decided to team up and go to war against Jehoshaphat and his uh, people. He's got a triple threat. The odds are three to one, three enemies coming together to go to battle against him. You would think that this would be a story of defeat and devastation, but in the end, Jehoshaphat really comes out the victor. He wins. It's a wonderful story because it explains to us the protection of God over the nation Israel. But God does not put these stories in the Bible just to teach us history. There are principles here for us to learn because the same principles which apply to this battle apply to life's battles and life struggles, and particularly of late, teach us how we trust God through something like the coronavirus. So what do we do? Well, first, this scripture teaches us that we turn to God. We are to turn to God first. Before we do anything else, we should go straight to God and talk with the God. We should say, God, what do you think about this situation? What do you think about what we're going through? <clears throat> you see, God's perspective is so much greater than our perspective. <coughs> he can see the beginning and the end and everything in between. We cannot have that perspective. We can't see past, present, and future all at once, but God can. And too often, we turn to God last. We look at prayer as a last resort rather than our first thought. Prayer is something that people usually try somewhere way down the line after they've tried everything else. Someone might say, well, I guess all we have left to do now is pray and that seems hopeless because we use it as a last resort instead of the first thing that we do. Prayer should be our first choice. If you want God to help you overcome any of the battles in life, we, then we know to turn to God first. Look, if you will, at 2 Chronicles chapter 20, and let's read these opening verses together. The Bible says, 
it happened after this that the people of Moab with the people of Ammon and others with them beside the Ammonites came to battle against Jehoshaphat. Then some came and told Jehoshaphat, saying, A great multitude is coming against you from the sea, from Syria, and they are in Hezazon, Tamar, which is in Gedi. And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. Now look, if you will, there in the first verse of 2 Chronicles 20, and you see the Bible says it happened after this. Circle the words after this. After this, there came a battle, the Bible says. Well, after what? In the previous chapter, in chapter 19, there's the story of a great national revival, a spiritual awakening. There's great joy in the country. There's prosperity. There's blessings. It is good times. Then it says, after this, after that period of blessing, there came a battle. Now, I want you to notice the first reaction of the king. The Bible says here that the king was fearful. He was afraid. And that's a normal reaction. That's a reasonable reaction. Here are three enemy nations teaming up against him, and they're going to come and attack him. That would be something like Russia, China, and Iran, all joining forces to attack us. So the king was afraid. The people were afraid. It's normal sometimes to be afraid. The problem is not that we're afraid. The problem is what we do with our fear. When we're afraid in a situation, do we let that fear destabilize us or discourage us or depress us? Does the fear cause us to throw in the towel, to give up, to want to quit, even before the battle starts? You know, the Bible teaches us here a very important lesson about fear. No matter how impossible the situation that we're going through may seem, we should not let that impossible situation intimidate us. In fact, just the opposite, we should let it motivate us. And you say, well, Ed, how can the problems and battles of life motivate me? Well, number one, it ought to motivate us to pray more. It ought to motivate us to trust God more. It ought to motivate us to expect God to take care of us more. Let it motivate you to depend more on God. So when we're going through some battle, <clears throat> some struggle, like the coronavirus or whatever it may be, the first thing that we need to do, according to this story, is to turn to God first. We turn to him and get our focus on him and not our, our problem. And that's exactly what this man did. He headed straight to God. If you go down to verse three, it says, he set himself to seek the Lord. And that leads to the second point in the story. Not only are we to turn to God first, next we see that he talked to God about his situation. And that's what we should be doing. We should talk to God about our situation. Think about this for a moment. There is no problem too big that God cannot solve it. In verse 5, it says there that Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court. Now he's standing there and just starts talking to God out loud. And that's a good thing to do. I would encourage you to pray out loud all you can because praying out loud keeps our mind focused. When we pray in our mind, sometimes our mind wanders or sometimes we may doze off asleep. But that doesn't happen when we pray out loud. So sometimes we just need to pray aloud to God. It is important when the odds seem stacked against us there is a certain way that we need to pray. It's different from the way maybe we normally pray. And Jehoshaphat here gives us a good example of the three things that we need to pray when we feel overwhelmed. 
Look down at verse six and look at what he prays. O Lord, God of our fathers, are you not God? That's what he's saying. O God, are you not God? He's reminding himself who God is. He says, are you not God in heaven? And do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the earth, the nations? And in your hand, there is power and might that no one is able to withstand you. The first thing that we need to do <clears throat> when we start praying about a difficult situation is to just remember who God is. Before we talk to God about the problem, before we focus on it, I need to focus on God and remind myself that God is bigger than any problem that I am facing. Just say out loud to God, God, you're all powerful. Nothing is too hard for you. With you, all things are possible. You rule over all kingdoms and, and all nations. So the king realizes there are three enemy nations coming at him at one time. Keep that in mind. But he also recognizes here as he begins to pray about his situation that God is bigger than all the enemies he will ever face. So he reminds himself of who God is. Then he remembers what God has done in the past. Can you recall the times that God has helped you in the past? Then that's what we need to do when we go through these battles and storms in life. We need to remember what God has done, the faithfulness of God, how he helped us. Look down at verse seven. Are you not our God who drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and gave it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend forever? So now here's Jehoshaphat. He's going all the way back to Moses and Joshua. And he's saying to God, he's remembering this. And he said, God, look at what you have done. You did all these miracles to get us here in the first place. He recalled all the ways that God worked in the past. And he's saying, I know who you are, God. I know what you have done in the past. And I know you can do it again. So as he talks to God about his situation, he reminds himself of who God is. He remembers what God has done. And then he asked God for help. And he did that right then. And we should do that. We should ask God for help now. If you read the next few verses, he's saying, I want you to do it again. If you look carefully down at verse nine, he mentions three kinds of situations in his prayer. He mentions tragedies, physical needs, and material needs. And he says, God, none of this is too hard for you. You helped us in the past. Now, please do it again. Let me ask you a question. Do you think this pandemic is too big for God to solve? Do you think the coronavirus is too hard for God? Not at all. God could snap his finger and it would be gone. But God has a purpose for this. We may not fully understand what it is. Maybe it will lead us to repentance and spiritual renewal in America. Maybe it will humble us and teach us the lessons that God has in mind for us to learn. But we need to ask God for help and ask God for help now. That's the way we pray when we're overwhelmed. Just remind yourself of who God is. Remind yourself of what God has done and then ask God to do it again. And then there's another thing here that we see in this story. We learned that the Jehoshaphat talked to God first and he told him about his situation. And if you look down at verse 12, we see that he told God exactly how he felt. He didn't beat around the bush. He didn't use flowery language. He just got right down to business with God in his praying and he told God exactly how he felt. Look at verse 12. Oh, our God. Will you not judge them? For we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us, nor do we know what to do. But our eyes are upon you. He's saying to God in this prayer, we are powerless. This mighty army is about to attack us. Maybe you feel that way today. 
maybe you feel like you're under attack. Our president has called the, the coronavirus our enemy. He says we are at war. Maybe you feel like that today. So what do we do? We tell God exactly how we feel. It's interesting to me here to compare verse 12, where it says we're powerless, to verse 6, where he said God has all the power in the world. Now, I want you to get this. You see, it doesn't matter if I'm powerless, if I know God has all the power. If I put my trust in him, he'll take care of me. I don't have to have the power. You don't have to have the power. All we need to do is trust in God, who's got all the power that we need. So tell God exactly how you feel. And then go back to verse 12 and circle the last part of that verse. Look at what it says. But our eyes are upon you. Our eyes are upon you. What's he saying there? Trust God to help you. You tell him how you feel, and then you trust him to help you. You need to focus not on the problem, but focus on God who can take care of the problem. The biggest mistake that people make when they go through uh, something such as we're going through at the moment or any of life's struggles is that all we tend to see is the problem. Instead, we need to put our eyes on God and not the problem. Corey Ten Boom used to say, if you look at the world, you will be distressed. If you look within, you will be depressed. But if you look at Christ, you will be at rest. You see, it all depends upon where we have our eyes and what our eyes are on. So let me ask you, what are you focusing on right now? And let me be blunt for a moment. If you are discouraged, then your eyes are not on God because it is impossible to focus your eyes on God and stay discouraged at the same time. Now we do these things. We do the same thing that we see in scripture. We turn to God first. We talk to God about our problem. We tell God exactly how we feel and we trust God to help us. Now, when we do these things, I want you to notice God's response down in verse 15. And he said, listen, all you of Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem and you, King Jehoshaphat. Thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Underline that last part. The battle is not yours, but God's. The Bible says, trust God to help you. And the reason that we're so fatigued all the time and so tired all the time is because we're trying to fight all these battles that belong to God. That's my biggest problem, and I would imagine it's your biggest problem. We try to fight battles that are not our battles in the first place. They're God's battles. And when we try to fight them, we're going to get worn out. We're going to get tired. You know why? Because we're trying to assume a role that God didn't mean for you and me. We're trying to assume God's role. We think, well, I'm going to make this thing work. Out of sheer willpower, I'll put my head down. I'll put my shoulder into it. I'll buck up and, and just say, out of my own willpower and out of my own energy, I'll come through this crisis, whatever it is. I'll save my marriage. I'll turn my kids around. I'll resolve my financial difficulties. I'll find a mate for life. I will make myself a success. God says, it's not your battle. It's mine. If you belong to me, I'll fight your battle. When I come to Jesus Christ and say, Lord Jesus, I want to serve you for the rest of my life. I want you to be my master and I will be your servant. When I put myself in the servant position to the master God, then the master assumes all the responsibility for all of my needs because I am his servant. When I come to Christ and I say to him and mean it, 
I am yours, then the battle is not mine anymore. It is God's. If you understand that, right in your home, say amen. You see, so often we don't get this. So often we don't think about this. But we need to think about it because it helps us. Some of you have been trying to fight battles that are not yours for a long time. And if the truth were known, even this morning, you're tired. And you're saying, I can't do this. It's too hard for me. It's too much. I just don't have the energy anymore. I quit. And you know what God says when you say I quit? God says, it's about time. I've been waiting for you to get to this point. Now I can get something done in your life because you're laying the battle down and giving it to me. Friend, listen, we can't control things. We can't help God out. God helps us out. But the moment we begin to relax and trust God, things start happening. God says, I'm glad you've given up. I've been waiting on you to do that for years. Are you going to start letting me take over? The Lord says to you and me. You see, I want to invite you this morning to do something that I learned a time ago, and that is to resign as general manager of the universe. The world does not revolve around us, even though we may think it does. We just need to relax in faith in Jesus Christ. Two times in this story, in verse 15 and in verse 17, God said, don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged. Why did God say that? Because when we face these overwhelming things in life like the coronavirus or these other problems that we go through, we are afraid and we are discouraged because we don't know what will happen next. Well, number one, remember, it's God's battle. And number two, remember this, God has never, ever lost a battle. Remember that. You don't have to worry. The outcome is inevitable. We know the end of the story. What does God want you to do then? You say, if he doesn't want me to fight in the battle, then what am I to do? Two words, and I hope you'll write them down. Stand strong. That's what God asks us to do as believers. Stand strong. Now, what does that mean, to stand strong? It means that we are to trust God with a strong attitude of quiet confidence, that we know the victory's won, and we stand there with assurance and confidence and a quiet spirit watching God, knowing that he's going to give us the victory. It means that we're not backing up but we're just standing there in the power of the Lord God. And we're going to stay put and we're going to watch God work and work God will. What do I stand on? He tells us in verse 20. This is a beautiful passage. Look at verse 20. So they rose early in the morning and went out to the wilderness of Tekoa and as they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. <coughs> Pardon me. Look at what he said. Believe in the Lord your God, and you shall be established. Believe his prophets, and you shall prosper. Do you want to be successful? Do you want to be an overcomer in your life? <clears throat> then do two things. Stand on two things. The character of God and the word of God. You stand on those two things. Now there's one more step here. And my voice is giving me a problem, as you can tell. 
but I'm not going to quit until I finish this. <clears throat> if you'll just, just bear with me. Because this final point to me is the most important of all. How to trust God <clears throat> when we're going through the coronavirus or when we're going through any kind of battle. Thank God in advance. Just thank God in advance. Look down at verse 21. You see, you turn to God first. You talk to God about the situation. You tell God how you feel. You trust God to help you. And then you thank God in advance. Verse 21. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed those who should sing to the Lord and who should praise the beauty of holiness. As they went out before the army and were saying, Praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. Now I want you to get this in your mind, what's going on here. This is a very unusual way to organize an army. Jehoshaphat's battle plan is to put a choir out in front of the infantry. General Patton would have fainted if he had seen this. But here's the idea. He said, does any of you sing? And he picked those out and he put them in front of the infantry. And he said, we're going to form a little choir here. And you're going to go out first. Now picture this. On one mountain are three enemy armies that have a mass to do battle against the nation of Israel. And instead of the Israeli army coming out, here comes a choir out to meet them. And the choir begins to sing. And the choir is singing praise to God and thanking God in advance for the victory that God's going to give them in this battle. There's a very important truth here, and, and I don't want you to miss it. They were thanking God in advance. This is praise and prayer and verbalized faith. That's what we see here. If you thank God after the battle, that's good. That's gratitude. But if you thank God before the battle, that's better. That's faith. And they thank God in advance. That's what we should do. Look at verse 22, and we're almost finished. Now, when they began to sing and to praise the Lord set ambushes against the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir. <laughs> There's the power of thanking God in advance. They started fighting each other. They started killing themselves. They turned and fought one another while the choir was singing. The choir was praising God. The Israeli army didn't have to lift a hand. Their job was to stand still and quiet assurance, watching what God would do. And the choir began to sing, praise to the Lord God Almighty. And as that went up to heaven, God confused the armies, and they destroyed one another. So let's go back to the question. <clears throat> that insurmountable problem in your life, what is it? The one where all the odds are stacked against you. When are you going to start thanking God for it? After it's solved, that's gratitude. How about now? Right now, <clears throat> this minute, wherever you are, thank God in advance. <clears throat> thank him in advance that he will overcome the coronavirus. Thank him in advance that he will overcome and defeat these problems in our lives. Thank God. God is almighty. God is all powerful. God is all knowing. And thank God today in advance for what he's going to do for you. God bless you. Have a good week this week. Amen. Before we close today, we want you to have the opportunity to become a part of God's family. If you are struggling with battles, problems, and challenges in your life, 
then the first step in trusting God is to know His Son, Jesus, who came to die for your sins to take your penalty on Himself so that you might be saved. If that's where you are today, please text the word Jesus to 828-374-1660 so that we can connect with you. Asking Jesus into your heart is not difficult, and it is the best decision you will make in all of your life. It will impact you for today and the challenges of life and for all eternity in heaven. Again, text the word Jesus to the number there on your screen, and we will be in touch with you to pray with you and to share how you can ask Jesus into your heart and life. Trust me, he makes all the difference in the world. If you are a believer and would like to become an active member of Woodlawn Baptist Church, please text the word JOIN to 828-374-1660 and we will be in touch with you as well to help you become an active part of the Woodlawn family of faith. Thank you for celebrating today with us in worship. As we close, this is Memorial Day weekend and we want to remember those who sacrificed their lives for America. In closing, take a few moments and watch this. Thirteen folds. Each fold a reminder of a life spent in service. Service to country, service to people, protecting God-given rights, preserving freedoms. Thirteen folds. At each fold, we remember the friends and family left behind, the mothers and fathers, sisters and brothers, sons and daughters left to pick up the pieces. Thirteen folds. And we remember the scriptures. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Each one loved greatly. We also remember that blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And today we pray, God be near those who need comfort. So draw close to those who mourn. Make your presence and appreciation known let this church be a safe place, a comforting place, and let us honor those who have given their lives in service to this country. Thirteen folds to signify a life given to service. Amen.